one of the things that I wanted to do in writing this book was to reveal the burden of strong black women in a way that did not place blame on black women solely for constructing this stereotype and living into it, but for but to show the way in which it is the product of systemic issues and that therefore um, systemic issues in the church and therefore the entire church, um, not just the black church, but the entire church is complicit in, in this. One of the ways in which the, the church has been complicit is quite simply by being complicit in the sexism and racism that gave birth to the rise of the strong black woman to begin with. You know, James Jacks, this white newspaper man, it is very easy to imagine that James Jacks was a member of somebody's congregation when he wrote this, you know, this public letter in which he said that you cannot believe black women because they're all prostitutes, thieves, and liars. So the church is on the hook for not forming him and not forming white Christians in general in a way such that Christian identity trumps racial and gender identity, right? That has been the great failure of the church in the U.S., but also throughout, um, throughout the world globally. So that is one way in which the church is, is complicit. The other way, kind of on a more day-to-day -day basis, is the way in which the church benefits from black women's labor without reciprocity, right? So the way in which the church continues to socialize women, um, black women in particular, as being the, the caretakers. I, I recently, um, I had a, a, a white friend who said, um, and, and, and a, a church woman, uh, who said she realized that in her own life, whenever she needed to delegate a task to someone and she needed to make sure it got done and got done well, that she looked for a black woman. And she hadn't really realized that until she read my book and realized the way in which she, as a, a very faithful church woman in ministry, was doing this on kind of a day in and day out basis. Um, so I think that is part of it. The also, the rhetoric of strong. When I was a clinical psychologist, I would have women who would come in and tell me how their how their pastors would praise their strength in front of the congregation. You know, in ways of saying, "Look at Sister Such and Such. She's just such a a strong woman of God." And the pastor would never know that they were in therapy. That internally they were crumbling that the strength they portrayed was a, a, was a myth. It, was, um, it, it wasn't real. It didn't reflect what was happening to them internally. And so all of those are ways in which the church does that. The other way, though, is the way in which we extol suffering in the Christian church. And I think there's a reason for that, but I think it's a very um, masculine way of reading scripture. Um, women are already socialized to be servants. When you look at the difference between little girls' toys and little boys' toys, little girls' toys are about caring for other people, right? They are about learning how to cook or pretending to take care of a baby or pretending to take care of a house. We're socializing girls into that early. They already get that message of suffering and caregiving. When we add onto that the mandate that God wants you to, to suffer for others, what that does is that makes that load even heavier for women generally. Then you take into race into account. And so what happens is people see Christian discipleship as um, the measure of one's discipleship is a form of martyrdom. Um, and I think that's a very dangerous message when we don't temper that, when we don't recognize that the language of suffering and servitude is filtered through race and gender in a society that is patriarchal and racist. Um, and so we need to be careful about how we use that language because we end up heaping suffering on some people rather than others. So it is women, particularly black women, who will say things like, God won't give me more than I can bear. I've never heard a man say that. I've, I've been waiting 
Never heard a man say that. Um, you know, if he brought you through it, he'll bring you, you know, if he brought you to it, he'll bring you through it, right? Those, I don't need, um, I don't need anybody but King Jesus, right? Those are sayings I constantly hear black women saying um, that are just, they're, they're just bad, bad theology. But they're saying it for a reason because they have been socialized by the church to think in that way. The, the cross is central to Christian discipleship. But I think the meaning we give to the cross really differs based on our own social location. And so there's a way in which, because most of theology has been constructed by white European and U.S. men, the cross gets viewed through the lens of privilege. And so it becomes all about the cross as a tool of suffering, right? Take up the cross. But when I look at what, what Jesus does, first, when Jesus says, take up the cross and follow me, the cross is voluntary, right? It is one that the, we take up suffering out voluntarily out of our call to follow Jesus. When you talk about something like the strong black woman, you're talking about an image that has been un, imposed upon black women, um, that they have had no choice but to live into, that they are socialized into very early on. And so it isn't something that's done voluntarily. I also think that there is a difference between, um, I think it's Sean Copeland who makes a distinction between suffering that is meant to temper the spirit and suffering that is meant to destroy the spirit. And, and so with the cross, what we're talking about is suffering for the sake of Jesus. When I look at the suffering that is induced by this myth of the strong black woman, I don't see Jesus in that. I don't see that women are suffering because they're following Christ. I see that women are suffering because of an oppressive system that really has nothing to do with Christ. And so I think we really need to be careful about how we utilize that. We also have to always hold the image of the, the cross together with this Christ who comes to give life and give it abundantly, with a, a Jesus who has a particular preference for the poor and the suffering. Um, and if we look at black women's position as the marginalized among the marginalized, they are the poor and the suffering. And, and I don't recall too many instances in scripture where Jesus says to the poor and the suffering, take up your cross, right? To the poor and the suffering, it is feed, it is nurture, it is a farm, it's healing them, right? It, that's what Jesus does for the poor and the suffering. It is for the privilege that taking up the cross becomes so central. So I think we have to hold those images together and we also have to read those images through the lens of, of, of black women, um, such that when we see it, we're not putting black women up on the cross to become martyrs. Too many of us are trying to be Jesus instead of letting Jesus be Jesus. Um, but that on the cross, we see the God who loved us so much that he took the form of a man, literally, and, and came to live among us and said, they don't understand how much I love them. I need to go down there and I need to take on their suffering. And I think the church needs to have that sort of response to strong black women, that we need to take on the suffering of black women and, and, and alleviate their suffering and bear their burdens as Christ has commanded us to do. Part of what I don't do in the book is to completely dismiss the strong black woman and to tell black women to abandon it. Um, again, thinking about it as a form of armor, there are times when people need to armor up, right? Um, and, and, and black women still live in a society that is pretty hostile in terms of racism and sexism. And so um, there are times when women have to armor up to get through. So I think... I think that is isn't appropriate at times. What I want women to do is to be more intentional about when they do it. 
And I want them to learn when they're in safe space and when they can put that down, when you're with family, um, when you're in intimate relationships, and to recognize the negative health consequences of living into that all the time. Um, in terms of how we combat the other ideologies, honestly, I don't think it's black women's job to combat that. I, I, I increasingly feel um, that the responsibility to combat racism does not lie with people of color. It lies with, in speaking in the U.S. particularly, it lies with white Americans. And so part of the way that we ultimately combat those negative stereotypes that give rise to the strong black woman is for, for white Christians to really do the work of interrogating what whiteness has been about um, and to interrogating their own creation of those stereotypes and the ways in which they continue to live out in society so that we relieve black women of the burden of having to fight against them because they don't exist in our minds. They exist in the minds of, of white Christians, right? They were constructed in the minds of white Christians. And so the, the ultimate battle against them has to take place in the minds and the culture of, of white Christians. And so I think it really is about the, the project of interrogating whiteness and what it means to, 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 be, um, to be white, an identity that is constructed on the subjugations of people of color around the world. Um, and to figure out all that that entails and really for um, white Christians to heal their own racial identities. Um, and, and, and that really is what, what the answer is. In the meantime, black women are in the position of having to grapple with this the best we can. Um, for me, again, it's about learning to armor up when you need to. But when I need to, I think is very rare these days. Um, most of the time, it is about being fully who I am. Um, and so um, destabilizing that image by showing the full complexity of, of who I am as one who cries, as one who grieves, as one who laughs, um, as one who experiences joyfully, um, as one who can say to somebody else, I need help. Um, those are ways in which I think black women are best able to destabilize the image. But in terms of the, the ultimate destruction of negative racial stereotypes requires a destruction of white supremacy. So I was diagnosed with cancer in July of um, 2014. Actually, I think a week after the book came out. So I had this moment of, yay, the book is out. And then it was like, oh. <laughs> in some ways, I'm very grateful that my diagnosis came when it did. One of the, the great things about writing this book is that it keeps my own recovery process as a strong black woman moving, right? It keeps me, I always feel like I have to be, I have to um, practice what I preach, practice what I write, practice what I teach. And so in some ways it keeps me me honest, right? In terms of my own recovering. Um, so I, so I think, I say I'm thankful that if I had to have a diagnosis of breast cancer, it came at a time where I'd had a few years practice trying to get out of this myth of the strong black woman. It came at a time when I was able to say to people, I'm gonna need some help. I can't do some things. And where I could say, I'm not going to pretend as if this isn't happening to me. I'm not going to pretend that everything's okay. I'm not going to put on a brave face so that everybody else can feel comfortable with this. Um, that when it sucks, I'm gonna say it sucks. When it's painful, um, when I'm grieving, when I'm pissed off at God that this happened, I'm just going to be who I am and fully experience what I am in the moment. And so for me, that has meant being fairly transparent about my process because so many 
black women who have had cancer are not. I'm, I've heard the story since then of so many women who went through this and they hid it from people. Um, or, you know, they, they just, you know, they, they kept it very quiet. Only a few people knew. And as a result of that, people didn't know how to care for them. People didn't know what, uh, um, what a, a, a truly rigorous, um, just hellacious process treatment is. And so for me, it was just being who I am and continuing to learn to be transparent and vulnerable and letting other people see me in that way. So it was being able to ask my pastor to come see me in the hospital before I had surgery because I wasn't worried about how I looked or, you know, I wasn't worried about the image of it. I knew at that time that I needed him present. I needed him to pray for me. Um, having my church um, make meals and saying, yes, please do that for us because we don't we don't have time for that to, to, to do that. Um, so it was... M- Allowing myself to receive the hospitality of other people, I would not have been able to do that if I had not gone through my process of healing as a strong black woman before I received my diagnosis. Um, Allowing people to see me vulnerable and to come see me when I was suffering um, and when I could barely get out of bed and to also say, it's time for you all to leave now because I'm really tired and this is too much. And um, sometimes I just say, I'm just going to go to sleep. They're sitting here talking and I'm just going to go to sleep because I'm tired. I'm not going to um, to try to be what they want me to be right now. I'm, go- you know, so I think it was it was very good to have gone through that process before my diagnosis because it allowed me to be in the in the period of of my diagnosis, I didn't expend energy that I already didn't have in trying to maintain an image. Um, I was able to fully devote myself um, to healing and recovery. Um, Willie Jennings. Um, he was my professor at Duke Divinity School. And it was in his class my first year when I still very much thought as a psychologist. Um, As a psychologist, I had been focused on trying to um, figure out how do we deal with racial disparities. It was in his class that I learned that theologians could ask the question of what do we do about race, right, as opposed to what do we do about kind of the side effects of race. But he also has deeply shaped how I write and how I wrote this book. So he, he taught me to write the body of my text so that anybody could read it, right? He said, that's, that's what you do, write it so that anybody can read it. And the scholarly stuff, you put that in the footnotes so the intellectuals can get the sources and they can get the, you know, the jargon and all of that. They can get the, but that anybody can read it. And I think one of the things that I'm proud about Too Heavy a Yoke is that so many women who are not theologians, who do not have MDivs, who do not have master's degrees, um, sometimes who do not have college degrees, can tell me that they read the book and it was deeply meaningful for them personally. So I think for me, um, he has been a model to me in how we in the academy can write in ways that it reaches the masses. And so I think it's a a model that I hope to continue.